issue because when you look at a chapter, you're like, oh, this is addition, so I want to do addition. Addition requires pi bonds. Or substitution requires alkyl halides. No. No, it does not. Okay. What you should be focusing on is the chemistry present. When I look at those two species, what you need to see is not a bunch of carbons and hydrogens and lines, but electrons or lack of electrons. HBr, I know to be a strong acid. Okay. You've gone through at least a year of chemistry, you know that's a strong acid. Okay. Because it is a strong acid, I know that HBr is better represented as H plus and Br minus. How did it go through and do that? Well, the bromine took the electrons from the hydrogen. So I have H plus and Br minus. Between those two, what makes it reactive? The H plus or the Br minus? Okay. We could switch it to HCl similar concept. Which is the reactive part? The Cl or the H? A lot of people will go through and say, well, the Cl, the chloride, man. Chlorides are super dangerous. So after this exam, when I get it and I freak out and I start crying, my face melts off because of all of the chloride ions in my tears destroying my face. I may not feel happy about it, but my face isn't melting off. Chloride ion, bromide ion aren't the reactive species. The reactive species is the hydrogen, H+. How do you neutralize an H+. Electrons. The bromide had electrons. It didn't fix it. So don't look at the bromide. Where should you find electrons? The only other structure. There's electrons there in sigma bonds and pi bonds. Which of those is most likely to interact with that positive? The pi bond, because? It's more reactive, because? Higher in energy, because the orbitals used to make a pi bond are p orbitals, as opposed to sigma orbitals. Those are higher in energy. So what happens? My pi bond reacts. What would then happen? Well, I now have a hydrogen connected to one of those, or an extra hydrogen connected to one of those positions. What happened to the other position? It's now lost electrons. We took two pi electrons. Okay? Those two pi electrons, one came from each of those carbons. I took both of them away, ripped them out, and said, OK, you carbon can have them as long as you share them with this hydrogen. Well, what happened to the other carbon? It gets nothing, which means it's positively charged. I have now neutralized that positive hydrogen. That's awesome. But in the same process, what did I do? I created a carbocation, which isn't stable. What would that thing need to stabilize? Electrons. Where do I have electrons? There's an answer. Okay. All of these questions are doing the exact same thing. Substitution did the same thing. Elimination did the same thing. Okay. The issue that happens is that each of those steps, you have to ask, should I have set that charge up differently? Was there another way to do it? Two questions, two minutes. When we move into our addition reactions, we will see all sorts of new terms thrown at you. For instance, Markovnikov. I hate the word Markovnikov. That was a phenomenal observation that the dude made before we knew electrons existed. So great, we're giving them credit for making an observation about something that he had by no rights any understanding of. We understand chemistry better than that. Focus on the chemistry, not on some silly rule to memorize, because the chemistry will get you through. Okay? Memorization of rules can get you through too. It also usually turns you insane, if you weren't already. Okay? So you will see me lose my mind when it comes to those kind of concepts. I'll address them, I'll point them out, but let's avoid that topic. Okay? So when we went through and looked at this one for quiz question number one, we just said, where does it react? Okay? And one of the questions that I didn't ask is, did it matter where the hydrogen went? Which carbon of that double bond should the hydrogen have been attached to? Notice I showed the hydrogen attached to the rightmost carbon. What if I had attached it to the leftmost carbon? 
I would have gotten the exact same answer. It would have looked like the bromine's in a different location, but all I did was flip the structure. Right? So it's an identical product. There was no difference between the carbons. What's the challenge now in question two? Now those carbons are different. Okay? So when we're looking for reactions and trying to predict something, we can go through and try and pull face test kind of arguments and get our HBr, and ultimately that tells us H plus and Br minus. To neutralize H plus, what do I need? Electrons. The electrons are in the pi bond, but they have to be associated with a carbon to neutralize the hydrogen. Well, where are the electrons going? Are they going to the left carbon or the right carbon? Okay. Well, if I ignore the reaction and just look at that structure, I could be like, well, doesn't that structure have resonance because it has a pi bond? Fascinating. Yes, it does. What happens if I draw that resonance? I could put the positive charge here and the negative charge there. That is one possible resonance structure. I could have just as easily drawn the other way around. Everybody get that? Right. Why is it useful to draw the resonance? What have I just found? Positive and negative. What did I need to neutralize the H? Negative. A negative. I now just found what can react with it. It now stands out and screams at me, put the hydrogen here. Okay. So by identifying those charges and finding those imbalances, you can follow the chemistry through the solve, okay. instead of memorizing a rule behind it. And this one is a, one of those silly rules. Okay. So now that we know there are two possibilities, that means the hydrogen could go to both. That assumes that both of those resonance structures are same energy. Are they? No. Okay. We've talked about stability of carbocations and carbanions. Most people tend to focus on the carbocation, okay? probably because you were taught by me, and that's what I focused on. Okay. Where is the carbocation most stable? Tertiary. So in the first one I drew, I have a tertiary carbocation. In the second one I drew, what do I have? Secondary. So that means tertiary is favored. I don't want the carbocation there. That's a bad option. Okay, well, maybe the anion is going to mess this up, and now you can do both structures. Well, where is an anion more stable? Primary or secondary. Where is it in the first structure? Secondary. Where is it in the second structure? Tertiary. Which one was more stable? What does that mean? My negative charge is on the secondary position. My positive charge is on the tertiary. If we ignore mechanisms altogether, what should react with the positive? What should react with the positive carbon? The negative bromine. So what do I draw? What reacts with the negative carbon? Positive hydrogen. Which I can get away with not showing because... Hydrogens can be implied. I have an answer. I don't know anything about a mechanism, and I have an answer. Okay? So evaluating these charges can really help you predict your reactions. So look to those charges. This doesn't mean you should ignore all the other rules that we throw at you, which we'll look at here in a second for this. Okay? And Mo, I'm just going to call you out just because you were already talking about it. I hope you don't mind too much. If we show the bromine and the hydrogen, this is one of the things that Markovnikov came through and said. Well, Markovnikov has a rule. And what was Markovnikov's rule? That's to do with double bonds. That's Zaitsev. What was Markovnikov? You add, I thought you added the place placement of hydrogen. You add what to the place? The bromine. The bromine goes to the position with the least amount of hydrogens. Typically, the rule is stated that the hydrogen that you add goes to the location that has the more hydrogens. The rich get richer. It had hydrogens, so it gets more hydrogens. The poor didn't have hydrogens get poorer. We don't add hydrogen to it. Okay? That's known as Markovnikov's rule. And look, he was right. Amazing. That's really cool. Why didn't he talk about something to do with 
resonance with those electrons and saying something about stability of intermediates. He literally had no idea what an electron was. If you don't know what an electron is, you can't do resonance. Okay? It was purely observational based off of figuring out where those pieces went in the structure. No idea why they were there. Just, hey, they're there. Okay? That is an insanely powerful observation. Those of you in lab should be kind of acknowledging something of that awesomeness because when we consider Zaitsev's rule or Markovnikov, trying to prove where those pieces went is not an easy task. So that is in and of itself pretty phenomenal. Okay? But we know more than that. So don't boil organic chemistry down into these silly kind of I don't know anything about electrons rules. You do know something about electrons, use them. Okay? Or admit that you know nothing, which I really hope you aren't there, and memorize the crap out of everything. Okay? And just hope for the best. Okay? I don't want you to be there. That is how OCHEM can run. Okay? That felt kind of depressing. It was supposed to be inspirational. <laughs> okay. I just want to get out of here. 45 minutes. Okay. Next one. What happens in the next one? Why is the next one now more difficult than the others? Ooh, there's two pi bonds. Okay. Which means I have two negatives and two positives. Can both react at a given instant? No, only one can react at a given instant. And this is where understanding a mechanism can help you predict what's going on with this. Right? And the very first one I drew, I drew out a mechanism. I neutralized the acid, and then the bromide attacked. And the second one, I just predicted products. Okay? The second one doesn't tell me how many steps or if there were important intermediates. The first one says I have an intermediate. The first one shows I have what as an intermediate? Carbocation. Does it make sense for it to happen in two steps as opposed to just both jamming on at the exact same instant? Okay. Well, what's reacting? What from the organic structure is reacting? The pi bond. The pi bond has what? Electrons. A bunch of electrons. So those electrons are going to come floating out towards the hydrogen. Do we have a positive charge yet? No. All we have is electrons floating out from our pi bond. As those electrons come up, the only thing they can interact with would be the positive hydrogen. What is the bromide going to do? If anything, it's going to move away. Can the bromide and the hydrogen attach at the exact same instant? No. If we had a split in charges, sure, but that's a resonance structure that allows us to see where the electrons spend most of their time. Okay? Our official structure says the electrons are evenly balanced in between, which means the bromide cannot attack at the same instant, which means I have to break this into two steps. Okay? That means in my very first step of this reaction, my pi bond comes out, reacts with the hydrogen, shuttles the electrons to the bromide, and I would end up with this structure. The hydrogen I would place at the end. Why would I place it at the end? So we could do Markovnikov. Thanks for calling it out so I can yell and complain and whine about it. We could say the position at the end had more hydrogen, so I want to put more hydrogens there. So there it was. It was said. Okay? It forms a more stable carbocation to place it on the inside. Why is it a more stable carbocation to place the hydrogen on the outside? Secondary. It's secondary versus primary. It's better than secondary. It's secondary with resonance. So what does that mean? That means with this structure, I don't have this one product. I actually have two. Okay. Why does that now add a wrinkle to this? Now the bromide reacts with what? Positive charge. Which one? Both. 
These are resonance structures of each other, which means both exist. Okay? Because they are relatively equal energy, both with resonance, the bromide can go to both positions, and I end up with two products. Okay? Is there something that could dictate one product over the other? Yes. From the exam, you had a question about energy diagrams, okay? and a question about kinetic versus thermodynamic, where those things were. Go back through the slides, there's a little image that shows where the kinetic controlled and the thermodynamic controlled is. Okay? Why is that important? Depending on where the bromide goes, we get a kinetic product, it happens the fastest, or if I change the conditions a little bit, I get the thermodynamic product. Okay? This is really just a precursor to second semester, because in second semester, virtually every reaction has two products one of them being kinetic and one of them being thermodynamic. You have to evaluate the conditions to say the thermodynamic is the most important or the kinetic is the most important. If you do it wrong, everything afterwards, regardless of how correctly you've drawn everything, is also wrong. So you have to be able to recognize the differences between kinetic and thermodynamic. All of that comes from an energy diagram. The secondary carbocation is slightly more stable. So let's push this one out a little bit further because we're getting some questions on it and you're like, well, isn't the secondary more stable? Okay, I agree with that. So that's a really slow eraser. Can I just erase everything? So three, two, one, go. So if we draw out our reaction again, plus our HBr, the result was this guy with resonance to produce this guy with resonance. What happens after that? Well, if this one reacts, everybody see that? So when we run this reaction, we have a reactant. We have an intermediate, which applies to both of these. And we have a product, which applies to both of these. Okay. So if we were to draw out an energy diagram, what happens? Well, there's my energy, my reactant. I don't really know what's going on, so I'm just going to draw the reactant right in the middle and just hope for the best. Okay. Let's take a look at my intermediates. Okay. Should those be higher or lower in energy than the reactant? Why should they be higher? They have, they have a charge. So I'm going to draw my first intermediate. There's intermediate. Hmm. But I've got two of them. So it might be helpful if we came up for names for those intermediates. How about we call it, I don't know, secondary and primary? Does that make sense? Where the cation is located? Which would mean the product would be our secondary product versus our primary product. Okay with that naming? Okay, so let's finish drawing out our intermediates. We have two intermediates. Okay, one is secondary and one is primary. Okay, let's call the one that's shown right now the primary. Where should the secondary go? Why should it go lower than it? It's more stable, it's lower in energy. So if I run this reaction, which of these two reactions would I expect to produce more product? Secondary, right? It has a lower activation barrier. It's lower because the product energy was lower. Okay? So that suggests I only get the one product. Why the hell did we draw out the other one? Okay? Well, let's draw out our products now. Which product do you want to look at? Oh, uh, that's a lie. You don't get to choose. We're going to look at the secondary one. Okay? Should that second one, secondary one be lower or higher than my intermediate? Lower. Why? doesn't have a charge. Should it be lower or higher than the reactant? Lower. Why? Only one pi bond versus two pi bonds. So my product for my secondary, we'll draw down here. Okay? So now let's draw in the primary. 
Where should the primary be with respect to the intermediate? Lower. Where should it be with respect to the reactant? Lower. Where should it be with respect to the product lower. secondary? Lower. Why are you saying lower? Because the primary alkene is more substituted than the secondary. What's the most reactive thing in those products? The pi bond. Why the pi bond? The pi bond has higher energy electrons because they're located in p orbitals. So I need to evaluate those two products with respect to the energy of the pi bond. The double bond in number one is more substituted than the double bond in number two, which means number one is lower in energy than number two. If I finish out my diagram, now what happens? Now we see a crossover between those two products. If I look just at that second step now, which would I expect to be the primary product? My primary product or my secondary? Okay, so for those of you, I can't really, actually I can't do that, because I can undo that. So now what we're saying is, new reaction. Which product do you expect, primary or secondary? Primary, why? Lower in energy product. Wait, what did we say from the first step, though? What did we say from the first step? We said the secondary. This becomes a bit of a dilemma. Why is this a dilemma? We get two different products depending on which direction we go. We could make the argument that our first step is so much higher in energy. That's saying that the pi bond, or the difference and energy between those intermediates is significant. Okay. Is it significant? They're literally resonance structures of each other. That difference is not enough. We get both products going through. So what does this mean for us? Which product would I expect to form the fastest? If I'm asking about speed, I'd be concerned about an activation barrier. Which of those has the lowest activation barrier? The second one. So this one should happen the fastest. Okay. But what if I don't care about speed? I just let it take its time and figure it out. Okay. Who lasts the longest, a Galapagos turtle or a rabbit? Probably the turtle. Okay, so if I remove the element of speed and just look at lifespan, I'm going to expect number one to form because that's the most stable. Okay. Well, fastest is really speed, and as you learn from 152, speed is really just a fancy way of, or not as fancy way of saying, kinetic. Stability is really just a fancy, less fancy way of saying thermodynamic. Okay. So I only want the secondary. How can I prevent the primary product from forming? What does the primary product have to do to form? the very first thing. To get that primary product, what has to happen to the reactant? It has to form the intermediate. How can I prevent it from getting to the intermediate stage? Don't give it so much energy. Make sure that the amount of energy that system has isn't enough to clear that activation barrier. Well, how would I write that in a reaction? What's that? Less heat. Uh, that doesn't look really fancy. Probably what we would write would be a temperature. Minus 78 degrees Celsius. That's cold. Yeah. That's so cold that I'm not going to be able to get the thermodynamic product. I will likely only get the kinetic product. How do I want to make sure that I want actually the thermodynamic? The kinetic, I mean, that's cool and all, but I don't want it. How can I ensure that I get mostly the thermodynamic product? I add lots of heat. What is that lots of heat going to do? Allow me to clear the activation barrier for that primary product. 
But if I have enough energy to clear the primary, wouldn't I clear the secondary? Yeah, yeah, I would. And a little bit, okay? Given two options, I give it, I don't know, enough energy to get to this line, okay? I got 100 balls here, why not? And I give those balls each enough energy to clear that line. You're going to tell me most of them go into the one, not into the two? No, you're telling me most of them go into the two. Yeah, I completely agree with you. How do I favor the thermodynamic? If I give the energy to get up there, what happens with my reactions? This is 152 coming back to bite you hard. Are all reactions unidirectional? No, in fact, all directions are, all reactions are reversible. Yes, if I give it that much energy, very few makes it to the primary product. What happens when I form the secondary product, though? I gave it that much energy, what does it do? It reverses. Okay. In the process of reversing, now I have more reactant. What can happen? Some of it clears that primary activation barrier. Can the primary one reverse? It's going to have a lot harder time because the activation barrier for the primary is insanely high for the reverse one because of that thermodynamic stability. Okay. So by evaluating an energy diagram and looking at how these things move through, we can do something about predicting kinetic and thermodynamic products. It's tricky. It's challenging. That's why we save most of it for second semester. Most of it. It shows up with dye-substituted alkenes because you have that issue with resonance and conjugation. It'll also show up when we talk about Diels-Alder reactions, and by we talk about Diels-Alder reactions, I have already talked about it and posted a video for it because I think it's too much content for this class. So it is my way of saying, here, watch this video. If you don't watch it, oh well. But you can watch it and be like, oh, okay, I get it. That's so easy. It's not. It's really not. It's really hard. Right? Particularly for those of you that have issues with spatial awareness, Diels-Alder is like the... Nightmare of nightmares for spatial awareness. Okay? It is in play posit. So you do get 10 points for at least clicking through it. Okay? So I've, I've made it mandatory in that sense. Okay? The rest of the semester is really going to be talking about alkenes and how do alkenes react. What we just addressed was really everything in chapter... eleven. 11, chapter 11, okay? All of that we did in uh, half an hour. That is chapter 11. So since we're done with chapter 11, I say we just move into chapter 12. No, I'm just kind of kidding. Whoa, what just happened there? Oh, I know why. I got to get rid of that. Oh, because I got rid of that. What the... So what we're really bringing in is this concept of our alkenes and how do they react. So we've got kind of a brief summary of what they can do. It's nucleophilic carbons and basic carbons. Chapter 11 says, well, I have electrons. I'm going to do the simplest chemistry. I'm going to look at the addition where it acts as a base because I know acid-base steps better than I know other steps. Chapter 12 now says, well, instead of it reacting with a hydrogen, I'm going to have it react with an electrophile. Okay. We really haven't addressed what are electrophiles yet this semester, believe it or not. We've been very kind of dodgy on that. This section brings in a crap ton of electrophiles. Okay. That's chapter 12. Chapter 12 doesn't do the nucleophilic...